Stefani Shuriani, Head of Research at Matthias Corbin's Collegium. Tonight, we will elaborate on the future of democracy, and uh, we will do that with internationally renowned speakers from all over the world and also from next door. In the name of free speech with an open discussion, because we believe in debates, open discussions as a fundamental democratic value. If you post on social media, please use the hashtag MCC the best lectures. And uh, interpreter devices can be found at the registration desk. Please return them at the end. First, I would like to ask Dr. Zoltan Soleil, Managing Director of MCC, to give his opening remarks. Welcome everybody, thank you very much uh, uh, for coming to our, our event and I'm very happy uh, to launch and to announce that uh, we start the little MCC Budapest uh, lecture series. <coughs> MCC is a private foundation uh, which was founded by Angas in 1996 and the, the aim of the foundation is to support talented young individuals uh, but not just uh, teaching and education is our goal but also research uh, publishing books and a lot of uh, other activities so please use the social media and use the internet if you would like to know more about our institution. The Budapest Lectures uh, is a very brand, a brand new project for us and uh, the aim is, uh, as you said, that uh, we are believing in freedom of speech and the democratic values that we uh, aim and uh, we want to achieve that in Europe, we still have a, a, a society where we can discuss a wide range of topics. Today's event, and today's lecture, is about the future of democracy. Uh, not just from an individual example, but also in the perspective of a democratic political system. As a matter of fact, most of youngsters uh, in Western Europe and in Europe generally in the Western world live in democracy. We in Hungary uh, and, and in, the eastern, in the central eastern part of Europe, we experience communism, we experience uh, uh, the problems of an authoritarian communist system. For That's why for us I think democracy, democracy is very special and very, very important. Um, democracy is the boring itself and it won't last, says Sean W. Rosenberg, professor uh, of the University of California and speaker of our event, and Rick Shankman, American journalist who is also going to contribute to the discussion of tonight, recently, recently published an article on Politico on the thoughts of Mr. Rosenberg. According to the professor's theory, human psychologically are simply not built for the political system we currently live in. Would, would he be right? Uh, this launching event of MCC Budapest Lectures is giving the platform for this question and we try to find an answer uh, to this very important topic. The speakers of tonight will be uh, Sean W. Rosenberg, Rick Shackman, Alvino Mario Fantini, George Shokin and Boris Kalanoki. Thank you very much for coming and I hope you will enjoy today's event. Thank you very much. one by one to take their seats on the stage. Firstly, Sean Rosenberg, whose shocking vision of future of democracy served as an, inspira in served as an inspiration for tonight's talk, is a professor of political science and, politi and uh, psychological science at the University of California. He is author of several books and studies. Now, at the moment, he's working on a new book, book Democracy Devouring Itself. Professor Rosenberg has also been a visiting professor, among others, at Princeton University and the University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on political psychology, populism, deliberative democracy, and ideology. Professor, please take your seat. The next speakers, Rick Shankman's career as a journalist and historian, who actually wrote the provocative article about Professor Rosenberg's lecture in Lisbon a month ago, began more than three decades ago. 
in New York. Over the years, he became an Emmy Award winning investigative reporter. He's a New York Times bestselling author of seven history books, including Legends, Lights, and Cherished Myth of American History. Mr. Shankman also wrote the book Political Animal How Our Stone Age Brain Gets in the Way of Smart Politics. Mr. Shankman, please. George Schoeflin is a former member of the European Parliament from the Hungarian Fidesz Party. He was also a member of the European Parliament's Committee on Constitutional Affairs. Mr. Schoeflin was a lecturer at the London School of Economics and the University College of London, where he became John Monet Professor of Politics in 1988. He is author of numerous books, for example, Dilemmas of Identity. Please, Mr. Schoeflin. is a Hungarian German writer and journalist. Mr. Kanoki grew up in Germany, the US, Poland, and France since his family left Hungary in 1947. After studying politics and history in Hamburg, he worked at the German Daily Tribune. He was the newspaper's Balkans and Middle East correspondent. He is the author of the book Anandan, tells the story of his family since 1252. In 2013, he returned to Budapest and still writes for the band. Stakanoki, please. Join the <laughs> and last but not least, the moderator of the night is Mr. Alvino Mario Fantini, a Vienna based journalist working as an editor in chief of the biennial publication The European Conservative. He is the European editor of the University of Bucharest and the consultant to the Dignitatis Humanae Institute. Mr. Fantini has written for several journals, including the Wall Street Journal, the American Conservative, and the New Criterion. He studied philosophy at Dartmouth College in the US, and he's currently a doctoral candidate at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. He is a board member of the Brussels-based European Dignity Watch and the Center for European Renewal, an educational nonprofit organization in Amsterdam. Mr. Fantini, at this point, I pass the microphone to you. Hello, you can hear me? Thank you. It's a delight to be here, uh, not just in a city I love very much, but among people I like and admire very much. My one regret is that I cannot yet speak Magyar. Someday, perhaps. Um, as Fanny mentioned, I edit this occasional magazine called the European Conservative, and one of the objectives of that magazine is the same as the objective of this inaugural event, this, this lecture series, which is to engage in public debate on issues of current importance, political matters, social matters, etc. So I'm delighted to have this role tonight as moderator. Uh, I don't want to take too much time away from the speakers. We are on a rather tight schedule. So without further ado, I'll turn to uh, Professor Rosenberg. Uh, do you have a microphone right there? Great. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, I'm very pleased to be here. My thanks to the Matthias Pardinus Collegium for the invitation. And it's always nice to come back to Budapest, which is one of my favorite cities. The, um, we are talking about the future of democracy, a simple and uncontroversial topic. Um, and I think, for me, in order to address this topic, there are four questions that have to be asked. The first is, why is liberal democracy so fragile? Um, and alternatively, why is some form of populism, either on the left or right, so enduringly attractive as an alternative. Now in 10, 12 minutes, I can't address those four questions. Um, but I will try with the first because I think it's a, as a political psychologist, perhaps I am best suited to provide some information on that in particular. So the first question is, why is democracy fragile? And it is typically regarded as fragile. 
Um, people in political science, when they talk about democracy, they say that it's always very important that there be strong democratic institutions and a strong democratic culture, all for the purpose of essentially containing a people who are quite likely to stray away from liberal democratic practices. And the question then becomes why? And I think to do that, we have to look at what liberal democracy offers people to begin with. And it provides, like any ideology, it provides an understanding of who people are, what society is like, and therefore what politics must be. And I think the liberal democratic view offers a vision which is inherently rather complex, <coughs> abstract, and hence difficult to understand and appreciate. So following on that, how are individuals defined? Individuals are defined rather abstractly by their capacity to reason and think in a fairly rational way. The, this is the basis on which we are all equal. We all share this capacity. And it is also the foundation of our ability to self-direct or self-determine in some meaningful way. As for society, society is in some sense a self-regulating system, which in the context of that constrains us as individuals. Um, however, we do differ and we are self-directing and consequently to change and development. In this context, what is politics? Politics is this, the activity of governing becomes an essentially collaborative effort involving negotiation and compromise. It is engaged in by citizens who in this context are equal and they both deserve respect and in order to ensure that respect, are ascribed individual rights, no matter how different they are by virtue of religion, ideology, sexuality, even criminals within a liberal democratic context are understood to have rights. The problem, I think, is this conception of politics and the world is too difficult for most people to understand. Um, the political science research, for 70 years of that research, basically concludes that in the liberal democracies, people in general know very little about politics, and what little they know, they don't understand. Psychology explains why this might be the case. Essentially, the argument is that in order to understand it, you have to think relatively, in a relatively systematic, integrative and abstract way. And in fact, in terms of cognitive psychology, the vast majority of people think in a fragmented, concrete, and simple causal or categorical way. And as a result, they cannot understand individuals abstractly. They cannot appreciate the internally differentiated nature of society nor does it make any sense to them to think of politics as negotiation and collaboration. They're not good at perspective taking. The kind of perspective taking required to engage people who take fundamentally different views than they do. And they're not very good at the kind of self-reflection required for self-determination and self-direction. As a result, when confronted with a liberal vision that they have to actually engage in in some way, they will find it confusing, they will misunderstand it, and distort it, distort it in their own terms. Given the confusion and misunderstanding, there will be a tendency to withdraw from politics. It's too boring, it's uninteresting, it's too complicated. Um, if forced to engage in some way, because it's confusing and hard to understand, it will create anxiety, produce a sense of alienation, and ultimately a sense of resentment that they're being forced into a world that they cannot make sense of. In this context, populisms and their attraction can be better understood. They are always there, populist movements 
have always been in the shadow of liberal democracies for the last at least 150 years. And the question is why? Well, first of all, they define individuals concretely and categorically. An individual is the specific choices they make, the particular things that they do, the particular beliefs they express. And these are learned, where do you get your practices, beliefs, etc.? They're learned from culture and from tradition. People from other cultures and, and other traditions are in some sense fundamentally different than us, is part of the conception. Society itself is regarded as a somewhat homogeneous, harmonious, whole, stable over time. It's made up of individuals who share the same concrete characteristics because they share in a common past now expressed in current culture and traditions. In this sense, there is a clear sense that there is a popular will, that somehow we all, in the end, want the same things because we are all, in some ways, fundamentally the same. Politics, in this case, is very much the business of action. You do the things that are required to protect the people, maintain their integrity, and provide for their needs. Leadership in this is key. Um, it reflects the popular will. It expresses that will and guides it also. Um, power is typically understood hierarchically. Um, it's, you know, the notion is, well, you can't really decide anything as a committee, of equal, of a committee of equals. You need somebody to lead and make the decisions, is the nature of the view. Um, because this more centralized and more authoritative power does reflect the needs of the people and their will, it need not be constrained by institutions if they, because they may just be obstructing the realization of the people's will, allowing government to act in the way that it needs to. Similarly, there is less tolerance of opposition. In this case, opposition to the leadership is really opposition to the will of the people. And the need to tolerate that is diminished accordingly. The result is a vision which is constructed in the concrete and specific terms that people can readily understand. And so it can be more easily assimilated, its values comfortably embraced, and the kinds of actions it requires are easily executed. Um, so it is attractive because it is understandable and it is comfortable. Now, when people have the power to choose, and part of the argument I make is society is only now becoming more fully democratic, such that people are more emancipated from political traditions, culture, and the influence <coughs> of elites. And now they are more free to make choices on the basis of what they want and desire, and given that freedom, people will choose freely to reject liberal democracy and the confusing and somewhat alienating vision it offers, and opt instead for the more populist alternative. Um, and that's why I suggest that democracy is devouring itself and that it is very likely to decline and perhaps the age of democracy is in fact over. Thank you. You're up next. Okay. Yes. All right. Good. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to begin with a story. I'm a historian by training, so I like stories. In 1952, Adlai Stevenson was running for president of the United States. You may not know his name in America. His name is. Uh, pretty familiar, at least to old timers like me. Uh, he was running for president. As he was getting into his car one day after a campaign stop, uh, somebody shouted at him, all thinking people are behind you, Mr. Stevenson. He quickly replied, he was, no, he was a real wit, he quickly replied, that's not enough, I need a majority. 
<laughs> I was glad you laughed. I wasn't sure if you guys were going to laugh. When I tell this story in America, people laugh. But it's an uncomfortable laugh. The people are supposed to be smart. It is one of our bedrock beliefs in America. It so happens, unfortunately, that it's just not true. Example. In 2003, President George Bush took America to war. A majority of Americans enthusiastically supported the decision to, to invade Iraq. The reason that they gave when pollsters asked them, an overwhelming majority, and by one Washington Post poll, 70% believed that Saddam Hussein, Iraq's leader, was behind 9-11. Of course, Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. 9-11, though, was the biggest event of our time, involving the biggest decision a country can make, war, full-scale war, and the decision to go to war. And people got the most basic facts about this event wrong. Holy cow. Well, I was thunderstruck by this. I couldn't believe these polls, and it got me so agitated, I sat down and in three months wrote a book about it. The book was called, Just How Stupid Are We? Facing the Truth About the American Voter. I wanted to draw attention to the fact that our voters in America were wildly misinformed to a shocking and shameful degree. And the fact is, American voters hardly know anything about politics. A majority don't know how many U.S. Senators we have, even though we've had the same number since the 1950s after Alaska and Hawaii came into the Union, and it's a nice, easy, round number. You can't forget it. It's a hundred. A majority don't know when you ask them how many Senators we have. Wow, that's just, to me, incredible. In addition, they don't even know that we have three branches of government. They don't know that we have a legislative branch, a judiciary area, an executive branch. How can they get by in a week living in America where all these branches are constantly in the news and not know the answer to this question? Uh, it's remarkable to me. And I was really upset about uh, the facts that I was relaying. The uh, public reaction, uh, well, the people bought the book, of course, they were immediately announcing to the world that they're smart voters because they're buying this book about these stupid voters. Uh, but I didn't feel I had sufficiently addressed the topic. So what I had done in that book was write a polemic to draw attention uh, to the problem, like Paul Revere, who's familiar with him from the American Revolution, running around the country and saying, hey, we have a 10 alarm fire here, uh, pay attention. So I decided, though, to write another book. Uh, and in my next book, I wrote about why voters are so ill-informed. Why? I really wanted to understand this, and I wanted to delve into political psychology, evolutionary psychology, biology, neuroscience. I really wanted to understand, dig down deep, what is going on here? Well, the title gives the game away. Uh, as the, in the introduction, they already uh, uh, gave away my, my big line here. Uh, it was called Political Animals, How Our Stone Age Brain Gets in the Way of Smart Politics. It turns out our brain isn't wired for politics. Or, let me be more precise, it's not wired for politics as it is practiced in the modern world. It is fine for when we were living as hunter-gatherers in small groups of 150 people or so, and politics amounted to gossiping about the leader and all the boneheaded decisions he was making. We human beings are very good gossips. Two-thirds of the conversations that we have with each other is gossip, according to uh, Robin Dunbar, a uh, social scientist in England. And I think he's right. Uh, we all know it in our own experience. So in the hunter-gatherer world, gossip was all you needed, right? You're just talking about people who you're going to talk about, you're going to talk about the leaders. And in that way, you're going to get valuable information about how they're performing and how other people are thinking about them. And you can talk it over with your neighbors. Wonderful. In the modern world, that doesn't work. Gossiping isn't enough, because we don't live in a group of 150 people. We live in groups consisting of millions of people. You have to know a lot of stuff to be a good voter, as Sean was pointing out. You need to know about economics and foreign policy and lots of other subjects. And you have to be able to think abstractly. Alas, most people don't know about these things. So what do they do? They go on instinct. This, unfortunately, is almost always dangerous. Voters generally don't have a gift for politics. They got a lot of stuff wrong. They don't do what's expected of them. 
So let me go through just a couple of these. And in my book, Political Animals, I go through more, but I'm giving you the truncated version because I've only got 10 minutes. So I'm going to rush through these. So number one, voters are apathetic. This is easily explainable. We weren't built for societies of millions of people. Hunter-gatherers didn't have a problem with apathy because who were they talking about? They were talking about each other, their neighbors. The leader of the tribe lived one door down. You could listen when the guy was having sex with his spouse. You could hear it. You knew these people intimately. So there was no apathy when your leader is living next door to you. Um, we do have an apathy problem. In uh, most American elections, um, we're lucky if we get 50% of uh, the eligible voters voting. In the 2018 election in America that we just had back in November, uh, nine months ago, uh, we got 50%. And this was in a, an, a what we call an off-year election where the president wasn't on the ballot. Well. The pundits were ecstatic about, wow, look at this turnout, 50%. You know, I'm not very good at math, I'm a historian, but 50% to me is not a very high number. It's not a very high number. Why isn't it 60%, 70%, 80%, 90%? In the late 19th century, it used to be 90%. That's when political parties were really strong in America. Uh, but the political parties collapsed after World War II, and so we get these miserable numbers. All right, so that's one problem. A second problem, voters have a difficulty reading politicians. Now, we are all born with a gift for reading faces and remembering faces. A baby at nine minutes old can remember the face and distinguish one face from another face. That's remarkable. So we have that gift as human beings. We also remember, social scientists have told us, uh, people who cheat us. We remember their faces, uh, much more so than if somebody uh, performs a kindness to us. We remember the cheaters. Wow, it's no mystery about why evolution uh, would have uh, favored that uh, particular advantage. We are great at reading people's emotions. When somebody is angry, we can read anger. When somebody is sad, we can read that emotion. But we have a problem. We make quick judgments. When we are reading people, we make a judgment about who they are, what they're all about, in 167 milliseconds. That is faster than it takes to blink your eyes. Think of that. That's how fast. And if we give are given more time uh, after looking at a picture of somebody or 10 set video clip, we don't reevaluate our initial impression because it was generated by our own consciousness. We don't even know how we arrived at it. We just arrived at it. If we're given more time to think about it, all we do is think up reasons why our initial impression was the right one. We don't reevaluate our commitment. That's a problem. When we see people on TV, we think we know them. Now this is nuanced and it's subtle, and it took me a while to understand it. You see guys like Ronald Reagan, when he was running for president, well, we'd seen him on TV in America for 40 years. He, well, he'd been on, in the movies for, for decades, and then he was the star of a television show like Donald Trump for years. So people, of course, felt comfortable with, comfortable with him. We saw him on TV, so we saw him as a friend, somebody we knew, somebody we thought we knew. Actually, we didn't know who Ronald Reagan was. And after he died and his family members started writing memoirs, um, they told us that they did not understand this man. Ron Reagan Jr. said in his memoir, I don't understand who my father was. But the American people were convinced that they knew who he was, even though they had never met the man. Wow, so why is this? What causes this? Because back in hunter-gatherer days, when you saw somebody, you did know them. You were living right next to them. So evolution gave us this confidence that when we see somebody, we know them. Because we did, in fact, actually know them. Now in the mass society, we see them on TV, and our brain tricks us. We think we know them. We don't actually know them. I'll give you one other quick example of this is 
Richard Nixon had been in the public eye since 1952, when he became president in 1969. So it had been decades. He'd run for president before, he'd run for governor, he'd run for senator. We thought we knew who Richard Nixon was. When the White House Watergate tapes came out, they revealed that Richard Nixon swore like a sailor. In World War II, he had actually been a sailor. Wow. This came as such a shock to the American people that his polls immediately took a hit. People were devastated. This guy had come across like this nice Quaker boy that he was, and in fact, he swore. I can't tell you how, but when we were living through that period, that was the most vital information that came out on the Watergate tapes until right at the end when we found out he had worked out a deal with the FBI to try to misinform the CIA and we gave him the boot. But that just shows you how we trick ourselves into thinking we know somebody. Uh, number three, voters punish politicians who tell them hard truths. Uh, that's a bad thing for voters. We like to think that we want the truth, of course, but we don't want the truth when we make a mistake in our own personal lives. And we don't want to think that our politicians have made mistakes because it's not their character that's on the line once you make a commitment to a politician. It's your own character, right? Once you decide, this is my guy, and he makes a mistake, you don't really care about him making a mistake, but you care about the fact that you made a commitment to him. So you don't want to believe that you made a mistake. That's why Donald Trump has been found guilty by the Washington Post and other fact checkers of having lied to the American people or deceived them more than 12,000 times since he became president. And his voters don't care. Two minutes, okay. It was an evolutionary advantage to deceive people. And I want to tell you a quick story about Lucy. Lucy is uh, one of the first primates who was taught sign language. She knew something like 150 words or more. The person who taught her how to do sign language one day uh, caught her after she had defecated on the living room carpet of the house where she was uh, being kept. Here's how the conversation went. Roger, Roger uh, Fouts was the uh, social scientist. Roger, what that? Imagine the primate and the social scientists are talking to each other directly, face to face. Roger, what that? Lucy, what that? Roger, you know, what that? Lucy, dirty, dirty. Roger, who's dirty, dirty? Lucy, Sue, who was a grad student. She's trying to pin the rap on Sue. Roger, it's not Sue, who's that? Lucy, Roger! She flips it around and directs the, <laughs> the crime at Roger. Roger then says, no, not mine, whose? Lucy finally, after being pressed in this face-to-face -face confrontation, finally admits, Lucy, dirty, dirty, sorry, Lucy. Wow. Guess what? Politicians are primates, too. Now, we are not sitting ducks. Number one, people who lie get a reputation for lying. Number two, we possess powerful cheater detection software. It's like McAfee for the brain. All of us have it and it's essential, otherwise cheaters would run rampant through society. But if a politician can convince themselves that they are telling the truth, then they won't show signs of nervousness when they lie. And that's a real problem for us, because if they're not nervous and they can just brazenly lie, then they can get away with a lie. That's a real problem. Finally, we have one more problem that's huge, and that's our biases. Partisan bias is the most relevant for us. One social scientist uh, likes to call it a drug, and it's quite a drug. Um, once we have committed to a political party or to a candidate, we are very reluctant to give it up. All right, I have used up the 10 minutes I was on for my opening statement, so I can't get into what we can do about all this, so consider this a bit of a cliffhanger. In a follow-up episode, we'll learn whether our hero, the people, can get out of the fix they're in. As I say on TV, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you for an energetic and well-timed presentation. <laughs> Can I please have the two minute I will give you a two minute warning. I may go on. As well as a five minute warning. Oh, yeah. You're not allowed to ignore the two minute warning. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, 
I'm very grateful for this opportunity to address you. Uh, you know who I am. You know, just as I said, I don't know what to write in the book here. Um, so, this is absolutely fascinating. A very long time ago, when I was quite young, it did happen, when I was very young at the London School of Economics, um, I did actually see Karl Popper, the philosopher, but I was too scared. It was very forbidding, but I was too scared to go and talk to him. Some of you who worked on this will know his work, Conjecture and Refutation. And that's how I'm treating you. You had a conjecture, and I'd give you a conjecture, a refutation. A um, couple of things directly from what you have the apathy problem. You get quite decent turnouts in Europe, so maybe this is an American problem. It's not in the same way that the European problem. Now, of course, I do have a Stone Age brain, and having been a politician, I do lie, but I won't take it personally. Uh, so, please listen to the voice of a Stone Age brain, speaking a really long, weird form of English, quite different from your English. In fact, you probably won't hear this, but I grew up in Scotland. Uh, I read Burns in the original. Not very many people, but I feel it's very useful to they go. So, first of all, I, I did some research on the topic. I'm an academic now, but I'm no longer an elected politician. I'm time to do this. So, Dr. Shea, I quote you. This is from the History News. We are wary of philosophy. Down that rabbit hole is Spenglerism, Toynbeeism, and other isms, and downright allergic to that sort of thing. History is the science and art we know to history. Well, now, progress is also an ism. I assume that that too is in the rabbit hole. Uh, religion, in a way, has something similar to that. I assume that, that too uh, is in the same category. And then there's the word science, which of course has a very specific meaning in English. In continental languages, to the mind, Wissenschaft, science, Theodus. You can work out which language Theodus is. Completely different meaning. It's basically any form of organization you want. So I think that you're being misled by Andrew Saxony uh, into a rabbit hole. Um, I hope you find some kind of rabbits down there. Um, so that's my first one. The second point is to what Professor um, Rosenberg said. Well, I want to suggest to you, and I'll go on perhaps if I have time to develop this, there's a methodological problem I have with your approach, was that you narrow down your approach basically to one discipline. And you don't take on more the findings of lots of other disciplines. And when you were talking about um, the whole problematic in a way, that people um, can't quite cope with the complexity. Um, sure, but particularly the complexity of the world we live in today, and I'm <coughs> trying to explain it. But I think that what we do have are methods of stabilization. Um, if I had the time, I would now give a very long lecture indeed on the myth, symbol, ritual context. Because I wasn't literature on this. But it was interesting to be in the Basically what I'm suggesting is that I accept the proposition that levels of complexity in systems analysis, for example, connection quality, is too difficult for people to cross, but there are forms of simplification and modes of stabilization which actually allow societies or activities uh, to produce forms of cultural reproduction. Um, yes, there are constraints. And don't forget that both formal and informal institutions both have to be factored into one another. Now, I think I've already made one of my methodological points about single factor explanations. I think these are uh, insufficient. And let me put Max Weber here about the infinite complexity of social reality. It is difficult. But that's what social science is trying to do, to try to grasp that reality. I've already talked about generalization from a single discipline. Um, well, I quote you again. Um, Right-wing populists, politicians, right-wing populi populist politicians have taken power or threatened to. In Poland, Hungary, France, Britain, Italy, Brazil, 
and the United States. Well, I don't really know what you mean by what a corporate is, other than something that you don't like. Um, it, it's reductive. And there are enormous differences, certainly, between Hungary and France or Hungary and Brazil. Um, populism, I think, has become a term which you use, not necessarily you personally, or I think here you do, simply to grasp something that's actually much more complex. It's reductive. Um, you can then dismiss it. And you certainly, uh, many people, uh, have created a kind of fantasy as the opposition to liberalism is populism. Well, actually, I'll come on to this presently. I think the real problem, the real opposition is not liberal democracy, it's liberalism. But that, I'll say that at the end, so get ready to be shocked. Um, so, how good are your sources? I mean, when you say populism in all these countries, have you looked at your, your historian? How, the, what about the integrity of your sources? I mean, I assume you read all these languages, Polish, Hungarian, French, or Francais, so so on. Obviously, it's Italy, it's but Brazil, you, you know Portuguese? It's an impossible language, <laughs> impossible to understand. Um, so, what I'm suggesting is that we tend to simplify on the basis of material which came from second hand sources, <laughs> which are not necessarily all that accurate. Um, I'll, I won't say anything about the journalists because Michael Boris is sitting here, but he is a journalist. So I'll leave that story, a bit of the story to him. Um, let me go on. Democracy. Now, because I have this background in social sciences, and I want to suggest to you um, you know, there's necessary and sufficient conditions in how we define democracy. For me, from the European Citizens Initiative, we don't have this in Hungary. It does exist in the European Union. Um, and it exists in Latvia and Finland. Basically, a given number of citizens get together, they sign a document and they ask the legislature um, to initiate legislation. Um, the legislature then debates it. It's not obliged, but actually with strong public pressure. It's an input from below. Um, it works quite well in Latvia. It works not that badly in Finland. In the European Union level, well, there's a long way to go. But we did reform the instrument, sorry, that's EU jargon, the procedure, and the new procedure comes on the stream on the 1st of January. Um, and some of you may know about the Minority Safe Pact, which is basically a way of finding EU inputs into minority protection and minority cultures. And that, I didn't have anything to do with it personally, but. Um, the instrument is there. So what I'm suggesting is that elections, yes, but in addition to the other means of establishing a link between rulers and rulers. Um, feedback, accountability, transparency, yes, I think these are necessary conditions of democracy, but this can't be absolutized. One of the things I learned in the European Parliament is that there is no limit to transparency. It's an infinite demand. If you say, well, look, here's everything ever want to know about me, somebody will say, well, wait a minute, what about that? Uh, or you could take it the opposite direction. Just the most recent issue of the London Review of Books was a very, very depressing article about the, I'm not going to call it transparency, the surveillance state in China. And the Chinese state basically is capable of knowing almost everything uh, that one does. By the way, those of you who are on Facebook, and Google the things like that are doing exactly the same. We're giving away personal information. Really, in this case, it's to the private sector. I'm no longer using my Facebook. Still is Twitter. Um, and I think the other necessary condition of democracy is a continuous redistribution of power. If rulers are ruled, this has to be both material power, redistribution of material goods, obviously, but symbolic as well. The citizens have to be <coughs> capable of participating in the symbolic processes. And note here the problem of minorities. They can never own the narrative. It's because they're a minority. The best that one can do is to dilute this, but it's difficult. 
How many? Five. Oh, thank you. Okay. Now, I'll do the same sort of thing as you, just you know, a shopping list. Uh, travels, difficulties of liberal democracy. Well, first of all, the asymmetries of power. Um, a concrete example. The journalists can freely write about Hungary without knowing a word of Hungarian. Imagine a journalist who writes about the United States without knowing the English. It's an asymmetry. Linguistic power. English has it. Hungarian doesn't really have it. It's, it's an impossible language, as you know. Secondly, and here I come back to Professor Rosenberg, we are living in the complexity. We are living in a world where linear and non-linear processes are operating, operating side by side. This is something which the state prior to globalization was capable of controlling. It's no longer the case. There are multiple sites of power, internal peripheries. If you want to read about it, there's a fascinating French social author called Christophe Gilly. But I don't think any of it's in English. I can see. Um, what else have I got done here? Yeah. The rise of liberal elites. Globalization has created the possibility for knowledge based elites to establish an hegemonic cultural uh, position for themselves. Um, and what is very interesting, I'm referring here to David Goodman's book, The Road to Somewhere. Not available in Hungary, but then a great deal is not available in Hungary. Right? We just we seem to have stopped translating. I quite understand. Um, we have a very, very interesting situation of something very close to the hereditary transmission of status. That's to say, members of the liberal elite marry members of the liberal elite, their children are socialized into that. It's beginning to look like a feudal aristocracy. And let me add one here. One factor here. At its height, the Hungarian or Polish aristocracies were about 7% of the population, much smaller in France than in England. This, and it is globalized and it's knowledge of the 20 25% of Western societies. It's not going to go away. It's a problem that democracy has to confront for the foreseeable future. I see most of you are quite down, so it's your problem. Um, Two minute warning, okay, I think this will be my penultimate point. Moral legislation, I take this from Zygmunt Bauman, now no longer alive, a great Polish sociologist, a very dubious background, a common secret piece with a, a fantastic sociologist. Um, this is what the leads do. They involve themselves in moral, leg in moral legislation. I'll give you one example of this. You're all familiar with the phrase democratic backsliding. I first heard it when Hillary Clinton came to Budapest in 2011, gave a speech and said, you know, increasingly concerned about democratic backsliding. This was to do with Hungary. A lot of information available to the State Department is not very good. But think about the metaphor of backsliding. It implies that there is backward movement and forward movement. It's a spatial metaphor which you then project onto a particular society. And if clearly backwards implies negativity, who decides? Who decides that going <coughs> backwards is negative? Why do we think this? Because we deeply, deeply have this belief of going forward, somehow a good thing. We can trace this back to Christianity and towards Jerusalem uh, and upwards as well, across. Um, that would be my argument. Um, and then, how many of you talk about democratic? Backsliding, and it's an elite which determines what is backwards and what is forwards. Very, very interesting. Uh, it's not democratic, it's an elite definition of the process which they don't particularly like. Um, my final point um, I want to make a distinction between this is democracy. This is demos, <coughs> ethnos, and ocos. Demos is citizens, ethnos is nation, ocos is crown. You have an individual who one day is a respectable citizen, then votes for Trump and he becomes a populist. How exactly did this happen? Well, somebody said so. That's it. Nothing else. So 
the linkage between so-called populism or so-called citizenship is actually a direct one. It's determined by an outsider who says, you're a populist because you vote for the I'm sorry, that's not democracy. My last point, uh, this is my second last point. You're in violation of that other uh, Can I have 60 seconds? One finite sentence? You can use your 60 seconds. Oh, I know that. Uh, so, liberalism, this is the shocking thing, liberalism is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition of democracy. <coughs> you can have democracy which is not liberal, you can have liberalism which is not democratic. Thank you. Thank you. I know our guests from the other side of the herring pond are itching to reply or rebut, but we will go to our fourth speaker. Thank you. I'll be much shorter. Well, voters are too stupid to be entrusted with democracy. I think most politicians will agree with you. And um, I'd say so. Charles de Gaulle said, the Français sont libres, French or cattle. He took a very dim view of citizens and did not think they should be entrusted with any kind of responsibility. Winston Churchill said, the best argument against democracy is to spend five minutes with an average voter. And in 2011, uh, a renowned German journalist wrote a really interesting uh, book with the title, The Voter Haters. He spent a lot of time with politicians in town hall meetings and, and he came to the conclusion they positively despise voters and looked down on them as being incredibly stupid. Now as it happens, uh, citizens took a dim view of the goal he had to go in the end. They took a dim view of Churchill, although they admired him as a wartime leader, but um, um, they thought he was no good for peacetime, so they voted him out of office uh, as the war started. And today, um, young people in Europe do not vote anymore for these politicians who hate them. They vote for new parties, Greens, uh, or right-wing parties. So um, it's probably true that we have an, an innate uh, a gift for telling who doesn't like us, and then we will not like them. So maybe that is a phenomenon we are confronted with today, a disconnect between the leadership, the elites, and, and the people. And it may be true that they are too stupid, but um, don't let it show. Don't let them feel it. I don't think they are too stupid, by the way. And um, I would like to... Uh, you have presented data and, and polls and all that, but I think we can present other facts that speak to the, to the contrary of what, what you have said. So um, uh, it is true, I think, that um, when conf especially when confronted with a, with a crisis and the feeling that their governments are not being helpful, voters will try out new options in a process of trial and error. That's a smart thing to do. Those options may include dangerous ones. Best case in point is probably the rise to power of Adolf Hitler. But even he did not get elected into power. He never got a governing majority in free elections. It was the elites of the day that thought it was a good idea to make him chancellor because they were more afraid of communists and socialists than, than of him. Who knows what would, would have happened if they had just let voters decide one election later. So if, if, you look, if we look at your... At your um, arguments uh, empirically, then obviously you do have a point. But I also think there are other facts that, that speak to the, to the opposite. Now, one is the definition of populism. Um, and I understand that you define it, but maybe you can correct me, as uh, politicians who offer simple answers to complicated, complex problems and do not have real solutions. Is that what populism is? No. Okay. <laughs> Please don't do it. Because it is what I thought uh, was here. Uh, and that's a, a, a salient point because can uh, so-called populist forces be beneficial for society? Can they solve problems? And um, 
Another question that I have is, do you include the present leaderships of Hungary and Poland in that category of populist parties? If you can quickly say yes or no. Hungarian ruling party, or both of you? Polish ruling party, populist, yes or no? In the American legal system, you have the option of not answering. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, if we look at, at uh, populist parties as, or politicians as uh, offering easy answers to complex questions but cannot solve the problems, then, then I don't think it holds up for some of these parties. <coughs> Spe specifically specifically in, in Poland and Hungary, I think the governing parties have, have offered real solutions to real problems on, on a whole range of issues. Let me just mention how Hungary averted a threatening economic disaster due to bad valuta loans. Many households and companies were saddled with Swiss franc denominated loans that became toxic when the exchange rate um, deteriorated. So the Orban government solved this by forcing banks to accept a political exchange rate below market value. These populist led countries, allegedly populist led countries, are the fastest fastest growing economies in Europe. Hungary's border fence has been much criticized, but it certainly solved the problem of uncontrolled migration, at least for this country. Taxes have been lowered, tax collection has been made more efficient, unemployment is down, and wages are rising. It is because these governments have a proven track record of being able to solve real problems that they keep getting re-elected, not because voters are too stupid to comprehend complex realities. Opinion polls show that voters do in fact recognize and call out simplistic government propaganda, corruption and fake news, of which there is a fair deal, but still believe that their government is on the whole and for the time being one that successfully tackles and solves relevant problems. I am convinced citizens will vote the government out of office if they feel it has ceased to be a problem solver. So my point is, Inasmuch as you define populism as something that is unable to deal with the complexities of modern life, that does not apply for some of the parties that routinely get branded as populist. A second point is the suggestion that voters blindly flee into the arms of political charlatans. I think the facts show that voters, when faced with transformational crisis, try out new options in a process of trial and error and quite rationally discard bad solutions while holding on to those that work. So let's look at Greece, where we had Golden Dawn, a classical case of empty populist sloganeering, a right-wing party. In the financial crisis after 2009, they were able to muster some support, but by now they have fizzled. Here in Hungary, right-wing Jobbik has become irrelevant, although they had a real point or two. They were the first to propose a border fence. They pointed to problems with gypsy poverty. But the ruling party Fidesz integrated this and other real themes that Jobbik addressed into its policies. In Greece, left-wing populist Syriza came to power with unrealistic promises, but realized that their ideas didn't work in the real world, so they changed and became pragmatic. That's another point. Parties can learn and change. Parties can, but voters can also. What did voters do? They returned to the classical mainstream party Nea Demokratia. So my point is, there are many examples to prove how smart voters really are when it comes to populist parties. They vote for some, then strengthen or drop them, depending on how they perform. Only parties that, on balance, can deliver the goods get to stay in power. So by and large, I think voters are collectively smart and can handle democracy quite well. Having said all that, I also believe that democracy may end or become a hollow shell at some point, but not because voters are too stupid. Here in Europe, we vote in national elections, but it matters less and less, because more and more, it is the European Union that decides on rules that we must, must all abide by, irrespective of who is in power at home. We do vote for a European Parliament as well, but it has little power, and anyway, the small bunch of deputies our country sends there doesn't measure up to the huge number of deputies from other countries with other interests who can vote against us. So, being able to vote, but not being able to influence much by voting, 
obviously can be interpreted as a decline of democracy. Another question is the economy. Are we entering a new economic system in which democracy becomes a technical liability? Historically, <coughs> democracy developed hand in hand with capitalism and the nation state as a result of the economic transformation of Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. Maybe all three, capitalism, the nation state, and democracy, will disappear as the result of yet another economic revolution. After all, history goes on. I want to thank you very quickly, all, all four of you, for making my job very easy. I don't think uh, there's much need for me to throw provocative questions your way. You have plenty to work with. So you two uh, perhaps would like to address or reply to some of the comments. Please go ahead. For our interesting comments, and I'll see if I can, um, if not refute, at least clarify. Um, one comment that was made is that, in some sense, democracy works because the people are offered rituals, symbols, a way of simplifying democracy in a manner that they can understand and therefore will operate appropriately. Um, and in some sense, I in fact think this reinforces my point that things do have to be simplified, and when they are simplified, the essential meaning of it is lost. Um, and I will give you an example of that. So a, a critical element of most democratic contexts is the notion of free speech. And if you ask in the American case, um, it's the first of their Bill of Rights and their Constitution. If you ask in the American case, do you believe in free speech? 90% of Americans, 95% of Americans will say, yes, I believe in free speech. However, if you then ask them, do you believe whoever it is, uh, a communist, an Islamist, um, should be able to speak in a public forum, 80% of Americans will say no. Should they be allowed to protest? No. Should they be allowed to teach in schools? No. So essentially what you have is the adoption of a, a symbol which has been empty of its meaning and gets distorted back in ways that they can understand, which is that really the public <laughs> sphere should be dominated by people who agree with me. So I think that, in part, demonstrates my point, this reliance on ritual and symbol. And it also points to, remember I said, a, you know, a second question is, you know, why is democracy persisted and why is it declining now? I think it has pers persisted largely because there is this liberal elite who um, are the political elite, economic elite, cultural and educational elite. They may be conservatives, they may be liberal, they may be left, they may be center left, center right, but they all generally agree on the basic rules of the political game, which I broadly construe as liberal democracy and try to define it. And the way that elite operates is they do two things. They keep those who are fundamentally illiberal out of the political game entirely. They <coughs> marginalize them. A classic example of that was Henry Ford in the United States, who was a supporter of Hitler. And in the late 1920s, he wanted to run for president. And there wasn't polling at the time, but a magazine did run a survey of about 250, 300,000 Americans. And at that time, Henry Ford was more popular than both the Republican and Democratic candidates combined. However, he had to withdraw his, his presidential aspirations because the elites essentially prevented him from running. Um, they also controlled the message. When you had centralized television, major newspapers, major educational institutions, there were certain kinds of messages that were simply 
deemed inappropriate and either never let in or marginalized. And what I would argue as part of a process of democratization, this liberal elite, the knowledge experts, the political experts, etc., have lost control. <coughs> They no longer exercise the authority that they once did. And the media world has been reconfigured in such a way as that everybody has a voice. And you know, so whether you live in a small village in whatever country, or you were a university professor or a journalist, everybody can blog, everybody can Twitter, and everybody can have lots of followers. And in this environment, that's why it precisely democracy is declining, because these people who never really understood it always felt uncomfortable with people who were different than they are, never understood this notion, issues of tolerance and opposition and free debate. Why would you have free debate if you know the truth, if some things are right and other things are wrong? It just makes no sense. Now they have much more control over the political domain and politicians pick up on this and use it for the purposes of, extent, uh, of uh, coming to power. With regards, so that's one point. Second point, the issue of populism and how to define it. I tried to offer a definition which was consistent with what a number of political scientists are arguing, that there is this notion, uh, critical to the notion is that there is a thing, the people, we the people and that in some sense we share common characteristics which are really a function of the culture that we share. And as a result of this, there's also a popular will. And politically this means if you have a leadership that reflects this popular will, they can sort of almost act in an unhindered way. Because if it is the popular will, yeah, sure, we worry about individual rights, but if us as a people require something, certainly individuals can be sacrificed. And as for minorities, they can definitely be sacrificed because they are not really of the people anyway. Um, and as for sp free speech and debate, yes, but on the other hand, you know, who are the real nature of the opponents of the leadership? They're ultimately the opponents of the people. And so you can allow for less tolerance of free speech. And I think that's the way in which they've tried to argue it. I think often it is also correct that in political discourse, it is used simply as an epithet. So, you know, I once, about eight months ago, was on a panel with Rafael Correa, who was president of Ecuador and a classic left-wing populist leader. And the first thing he said is whenever the neoliberal establishment doesn't like someone, you label them a populist. And I think that's fair. I think that's true. If they're not carefully, I and mean, in the United States, they're doing the same thing with people like Bernie Stan Sanders saying he's a populist, whereas by no stretch of the imagination do I think he is. Um, as for being effective problem solvers, you don't have to be democratic at all. I think we could all argue that in some sense the Chinese leadership has been the most effective problem solvers of all. Um, and it is by what by our standards would often look like an absolutely ruthless and brutal use of power in order to achieve whatever ends. Um, Then there's a, a real question of what, because there's liberal democracy and then there's democracy, and that's a fair distinction. Um, because we can imagine democracy without some of the accoutrements of liberal democracy. So what would you have to get rid of? A key element of liberal democracy is individual rights, often minority rights as well. Um, the way they, a second element is political equality. And the way those things are ensured against power, because now in a liberal democratic context, power is viewed with suspicion in part. And so you have the rule of law 
to sort of control excesses and ensure individual rights, et cetera, and free speech. Um, now, if we get rid of those, we don't worry about free speech so much, we don't worry about equality so much, and we don't worry about individual rights so much, then we have to think, what is the quality of the democracy that we have left? The only thing that's really left there, left is kind of popular rallies where everybody gets to scream the same slogans um, and all others are marginalized. Um, and the shift toward a kind of popular authoritarianism seems like a very real possibility in that context. Thank you. Uh, before you uh, reply, and I, I know you're itching to, uh, I just want to use my prerogative to uh, share with everyone that uh, when you talk about liberal elites, I think immediately of two different writers or thinkers, one from the 40s and 50s, James Burnham, who was warning about the rise or the emergence of the managerial elites worldwide. And the other name I think of, controversially, uh, I think, is Charles Murray and Richard Hernstein, who wrote The Bell Curve, the, the much maligned book, which identified the cognitive elites that were emerging. Now, these uh, elites, uh, however you want to describe them, have emerged both at the level of the nation state, but also worldwide. And they are the cosmocracy, they are the people. I think that a lot of the uh, Gilets Jaunes people and the populist supporters are railing against the multilateral institutions which are full of these cosmopolites, these liberal elites. I think after Rick replies, perhaps we can come back to this uh, dichotomy between populists and elites, because I think it's very fascinating. Well, I just want to uh, just say, the reason I didn't answer the question about whether I regarded Hungary as populist is, um, quite frankly, and I'm, I, I simply don't know. I don't have enough information. Uh, unlike many of my colleagues, I'm not so willing to jump into the void. And so part of the reason I came is because I did want to listen and hear with regard to that. So that was the, I wasn't simply avoiding your question in a cute way. Okay. All right. Uh, so first I want to start off with a concession. Uh, I absolutely agree with you that the term populism is almost useless. Uh, as a historian, everything to me is only relevant when it is put into context. So when you tell me populism, what I immediately think of is the populace of the prairie in America. These were people in the late 19th century, they were farmers who had been beat down by a droughts by greedy Eastern bankers in their nomenclature uh, who had bankrupted them and they finally exploded. So what do I learn from that? I learned that the populace correctly identified a problem. They did have a problem. They were being ground down and they were demanding action. So there was an explosion. That really was an important point. Were they stupid? No. No, they were not stupid. They were real people reacting to a real problem. Now, they also uh, dabbled in anti-Semitism, and that was no good. They did demonize East Coast bankers to the point where they became a caricature rather than real human beings who were just grappling with their own problems and trying to solve them. And of course, this is the Gilded Age, so you had uh, an easy way to uh, demonize them because they're living in mansions on Fifth Avenue in New York City, and the poor impoverished farmers in America are literally living in log cabins. So it was an easy caricature to make, uh, but nonetheless, there was at the bottom, there was something very real to it. Now, they did not want to give up their rights. In the American tradition, they helped expand the rights of our liberal democracy. When I say liberal, I don't mean, I mean classical liberalism. Um, they demanded that we were going to have um, uh, reforms to control the banks. The eventual uh, uh, 
uh, reform that came out of that was under Woodrow Wilson when the Federal Reserve was created, which, uh, while it enhanced the power of banks in some ways, also restrained them and regulated them, subjected them to government control. And the populists were very much into um, giving the central government in Washington power over the economy to help alleviate pain. Um, one of the classic examples is the populist farmers were so beat down they didn't have enough money to, to buy seed. Grover Cleveland, who was a Democrat and tried to represent the people and was very much a man of the people, he wasn't a rich man by any means, one of the rare presidents who wasn't rich, um, he refused on ideological grounds, conservative ideological grounds, if you can believe this, to allow the Congress to provide an appropriation for seeds for Texas farmers. Um, there was a measure that came up, and I think he vetoed it if uh, my memory is right, or didn't even come up to it, he opposed it. I can't remember right now, it's been a uh, decade since I studied that part. But um, So we have uh, populists who were trying to do uh, good things, and there's no problem with that. Um, my problem with the voters is really separate and apart. I don't attack the populace. Um, my reference in the article was I'm actually uh, uh, citing uh, Sean's work in that, in that particular paragraph. So it's not me trying to say uh, that liberal dem uh, democracy is uh, opposed to populism. In the American tradition, actually, it's quite the reverse. Populism did enhance the democracy. Having said that, I also want to address this question of simplifying politics to the point where the stupid voter, the stereotypical stupid voter, can follow along. So, okay, all politics is a simplification. Mario Cuomo said it right when he said uh, he was, a, he was a, a, a very popular uh, governor of New York who uh, toyed with running for president uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, he said that uh, campaigning is done in poetry and governing is uh, done in prose. So when you are dealing with poetry, you are creating big pictures. Virginia Woolf said it more uh, concretely. She said, politics is like taking a giant chalk on a giant blackboard and writing in really big letters. That is true of politics left, right, center, populist, non-populist, doesn't matter. That is because people are leading their own lives and they're busy with their own lives. They're earning a living, they're raising their children, they're going to church, they're doing all kinds of things. And uh, we're not living in hunter-gatherer communities anymore where the politics is really simple to understand. It's very complicated in that society. So I wouldn't expect that to be able to follow the debates as if they were holding a PhD. That's an, an unrealistic uh, expectation, and it's not looking down on the people um, to uh, say that they uh, are not terribly nuanced. Um, uh, I, I went on the John Stewart show, uh, the Daily Show, when my Just How Stupid Are We book came out, and I think the first question that he said was, so you really think voters are stupid? I said, no, that would be as dumb as saying voters are smart, which is what politicians do all the time when they're trying to curry favor with their voters. They said the voters are smart. Well, you can't characterize millions of people as either smart or dumb. Uh, but our politics are stupid quite often. They are pitched to a low level um, so that the person with the least amount of knowledge can feel that they are part of the debate. And what that means is that politics always has to be about uh, uh, issues susceptible to public debate. So that means taking many issues off the table. I remember when I was reading the papers of Dwight Eisenhower. I'm going to wind up in a moment. Yes. Yeah. All right. I remember when I was reading the papers of Dwight Eisenhower doing research on him years ago. Um, in um, private conversation, uh, he was being uh, uh, pressured to explain his new look defense policy and to talk about um, nuclear weapons. And Eisenhower looked at the person like they were crazy and said, I'm not going to talk to the American people about nuclear weapons. Heaven's sake, um, I can barely understand the conversation about nuclear weapons. That is not an issue susceptible to public debate. So we took it off the table. 
And I think that what populists do is they, they seize on a couple of issues that people can have an opinion on. You don't need to have a PhD to have an opinion on it. And then they run with it. Sometimes they run with it in a demagogic way. And that, for me, is when I want to criticize them. Okay. I'd like to give you both an opportunity to respond. And then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I, have you ever spent time campaigning? Because I have. I've campaigned both in this country and in Britain. Um, I campaigned in the 1975 referendum of the European Union, for example. We've been pro EU, obviously, taken part in quite a few campaigns in this country. Uh, in this respect, you all know there's an election on the 13th. <laughs> okay. Just asking, drawing their attention to the fact that there's no place for apathy on the 13th. And there you are. That's, that's a form of campaigning. I don't actually sense any Stone Age brains in the audience, but maybe your Stone Age brain detector is better than mine. Um, people, um, I I think you go back to a Rousseauian concept of the popular will. I don't actually think that everybody accepts that. I think the population is in fact much more complex. And it's that complexity which works its way uh, into what we call politics. I'm, I'm sort of not too far from a Foucauldian and Foucault's concept of power. But there's power of some kind in every transaction. There's a tiny amount of power, truly trivial, that I buy a tram ticket. I don't get it all, but you know what I mean. Um, so it's the question of how power is exercised, the means, the style, that gets us into the myth symbol complex, which I could spend a lot of time with. Them. And basically, uh, the acceptance by the person with whom you're having the transaction of how you're dealing with him or her. And the second point in this context is we're not just individuals, we're also members of collectivities. We have individual identities, we also have collective identities. Those two are in continuous interaction. This is, I think, the biggest flaw that I see in the current, or actually to some extent, John Stuart Mill's version of liberalism. It doesn't know what to do with collective identities. Um, in fact, a lot of 19th century liberals were really very uneasy. For example, a trade union. Membership of a trade union is a form of collective identity. Collective identities were banned because this is a interference in the freedom of the market. Next point I want to make is, in a sense, what I get from you is that for both of you, politics is adversarial. I think you have a Carl Schmittian sense of politics of friend enemy. I don't want to accuse you of being Schmittian because that's not a nice thing to be. But Carl Schmitt, the so called uh, Nazi, uh, he was really a jurist rather than a political scientist. It's a very important concept. But in extremes, it, the key thing that matters is the friend's enemy. Um, I think in extremes, in extreme circumstances, um, today I believe there is some the beginning to be. More than beginning to be an adversarial relationship between liberals and non liberals, who may or may not be populists by anyone's definition. Uh, and what I want to suggest here is that there are actually consensual systems of political behavior. I'm thinking, for example, of power sharing, called associations, where people get to, elites get together, they represent <coughs> sub societies, uh, and find some kind of an agreement. Um, I don't play a part as the person to read this. Um, it's very, very unpopular in liberal, liberal circles because it offers a particular status to a collective, a status group, and therefore basically denies the universality of liberalism. That, I think, is a central theoretical problem. Um, two more tiny points. You know, you know, my points are very small. Um, what I want to add here, which I think you have to answer, those of you uh, defending liberalism, the liberalism we have to, have it to do has created 
to my mind, intolerable inequalities, material inequalities, and other inequalities, lack of dignity accorded to others. That gets back, back to the reptilian brain, the stony brain. And one final point, we're in Central Europe. And in Central Europe, freedom is classically linked to nationhood. This is very, very liberal for my West European colleagues to understand. I never really did manage to get that over in the European Parliament. Well, let me pick up right there. We have a semantic problem when it comes to liberty. Uh, you say liberty or freedom, we say freedom, and it is <coughs> the same word, but we mean different things. And that has historical reasons in, in Western Europe and America grew out of Western Europe. Uh, freedom and liberty was born out of resistance to oppression by the aristocracy, the clergy, and what have you not. Uh, it was a fight for individual freedoms. In Eastern Europe, freedom was born out of a fight for freedom from oppression by often enough atheist uh, for a second, uh, I feel a deep unease with some of the things that you have said because I think we cannot have a good quality democracy with elites who have lost faith in voters, in the innate smartness of voters and their ability to adapt to changing circumstances. Of course, everyone can be stupid or unable to grasp something at a given moment when something is new and you need to understand the problem, right? But um, why not take into account the capability, the ability of our voters and politicians, as it were, to understand, learn, and adapt over time? Mm -hmm. Yes, most Americans and all of the American media who are supposed to uh, keep citizens uh, in a certain bandwidth of, of acceptable opinions, they all fell for it. But today they don't think so anymore, do they? So there is a there is a an ability to learn, and we should we should trust voters um, to do the right thing over time, even if they don't if they make instinct uh, decisions and don't reflect on everything in a very differentiated way. We have a quick response. We have one minute for response, then we turn to the audience. I assume there are questions. <coughs> okay. So when I wrote, uh, just how stupid are we? I. Uh, was very pessimistic. And then when I spent 10 years going to the research into neuroscience and evolutionary psychology and political psychology, I discovered something called the theory of effective intelligence, now known as the theory of effective agency. And in a nutshell, what this means is that all human beings come equipped with a part of their brain that makes them anxious when there is a mismatch between their idea of the way the world works and the reality, the evidence in front of them. And when that mismatch becomes great enough, they get literally a queasiness in their stomach, which sends a message uh, through their brain that they should reevaluate their commitments. That feature of the brain is what gives me hope. And in the Political Animals book, the latest book I wrote, I'm very hopeful because I agree with you that when voters ultimately see that something is not working, they will reconsider their commitments. So, yes, and so that, that piece of it, I absolutely agree with you. Okay, good question. Um, just two quick points. Um, am I a defender of liberalism? Absolutely not. I'm saying that the liberal presuppositions about its citizenry are wrong. Um, John Rawls wrote a book called Political Justice, the great liberal of the late 19th century, uh, late 20th century, and basically he made claims about people's rationality, et cetera, and sense of justice, and he said, these are our assumptions. They are necessary assumptions for any notion of political justice I have. If they are wrong, he didn't say this, but I would add, if they are wrong, his political uh, his notion of political justice falls with those assumptions. So it's, there's not a defense of liberalism here. It's an analysis of what it demands and what it's getting in return. With, and then the only second point is we have to be 
very careful as we worry about what's populist and not. We also have to be very careful about smart and stupid, because what do they really mean? And I find the distinction very, very problematic. And so in my own work, um, part of which has been surveyed, but a lot of it is involved hundreds of hours with hundreds of people in in-depth for two to three hour interviews about how they make sense of things. Um, I'm interested in characterizing how they think such that they are coming to the opinions that they are coming to and are reacting to situations in the way that they're reacting. And I think that's quite important. I should add, um, unlike Rick, I'm not an evolutionist. I'm not talking about Stone Age brains here. I'm saying it's hardwired. I take for a variety of reasons, I take a developmental psychological position, which is that it accepts the plasticity of human thinking and it gets interested in the social conditions that foster development of our Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience. And please don't disguise a comment or a statement as a question. Just go right to the question, please. If there are no questions, Gentlemen here with the uh, headphones, please. Can you make a phone for us? Az érdekelne engem, hogy mi az önök véleménye azokról a meglátásokról, miszerint a demokrácia az tulajdonképpen egy bábjáték a pénzi láthatók kezében a tömegek manipulálására. more as an aspiration definition of what are the assumptions, I mean you made the, you know, good, good reference to roles, but if you would actually take it as a functional definition, so what is constitutional or liberal democracy, if you will, right now meant to deliver for our society in terms of coordination, and obviously if you, if you take it, how the society and the world is changing, both in terms of production. So, you know, the liberal democracy had a certain function for industrial society. It allowed coordination of a large number of individuals, perhaps in a similar fashion like religions have done before. So we could also see liberal democracy as a sort of non-religious religion that allowed coordination of the society. So if you look at both the changes in the production system, changes in how we consume information, how we share the information, there were some uh, elements to that. Where do you see, obviously recognizing that democracy is going to be different, so how is it going to be different looking into the future? Question addressed to both our overseas guests. Everyone, any area. All four of you. 
I'll start with some simplistic remarks, <laughs> hopefully journalists. Um, I don't know, uh, but I, I do think that uh, we should not look on democracy as a religion where we all need to pray along and it will be there until the end of times. It has a function. There's some functions that are independent of other things, like it enables us to, to change power I mean, without bloodshed. So that's a good thing. Um, but obviously there's a connection with the emergence of, of capitalism and the nation state. Um, these three go hand in hand. Now, who knows? What about the global economy? Do we need global transnational government in order to tackle um, multinational companies? Google, Amazon, Facebook. Can transnational government be democratic at all? I cannot imagine it. Or do we need uh, to tackle the challenges of globalism nationally in the nation states? Uh, but for that, we would probably need to um, centralize power in those states much more strongly in, in order to be able to react with some efficiency against these, these huge market players. Just a thought. Uh, let me take up the points that you made. I mean, you will accept the term sort of aggregation rather than coordination. They're not quite the same, but they're quite close. I think every political system tries to find ways of aggregating interests. My position on this is that this is becoming increasingly difficult. I think we're in agreement on this. You may be familiar with the work on systems theory of wicked problems, or the moral condemnation. Uh, problems which are impossible to solve, which means that at a certain point pragmatism fails us. The classic case is health. The demand for health is infinite. The amount of money available for healthcare is finite. You can't resolve it. Uh, so we have to be aware that the problems of aggregation are intensifying. And I think here I'm quite close to what it's the left side of the table to you, the right side of the table to me, was saying uh, the complexity of society is that differentiations. I'm prepared to use the word fragmentation. How do you uh, create systems where we can never go back to the 1970s or 80s, I and mean, that's quite clear. But I think we have to rethink what we mean by democracy. I've said some things. We need a different mix of communication. We need a different uh, way of solving the problem of elites, which decides that life is very good as an elite and changing, that they're no longer capable of doing what they led there to do. Uh, you will recall possibly Max Weber's politics as a vocation um, responsibility. Uh, kind. And I think that we do have irresponsible elites. Uh, how do you get rid of them? Tricky. Without a revolution. Of course, as a conservative, I've never spoken about that actually. There are circumstances where I quite like revolutions, but let's leave it to one side. Um, one, a couple of other points I would make in this context. One is, uh, how robust the constitutional patriotism is not enough to aggregate, to maintain the solidarity which I think is the first time we use this word. And secondly, I, it's an open question, what is to be the role of the street? What is to be the role of demonstrations, public demonstrations? Um, one little footnote, a little Hungarian footnote, that Baker and I left, be smart. They're almost unique, not quite, but they're very, very unique large demonstrations in support of the government. The only one I can think of is <coughs> sometime, yes, 23rd of June 1968, about 800,000 to a million people came out to support the goal after the events of the May events of 1968. It's very rare. Mostly demonstrations are against power. Sometimes they're in favor. If you could both make pithy statements, I apologize, but it would be really helpful. Okay, all right, I'll try. Uh, first, I have to tell you as a historian, I don't engage in uh, arguments uh, trying to predict the future. Historians can't even agree on the past, let alone start addressing the future. Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, there's a founding father who had a, uh, a great impact on the uh, writing of uh, the Constitution. His name was uh, Dickinson. And uh, he had one of his quotes uh, during the convention that I have always thought uh, striking. He said, experience must be our only guide. Reason may mislead us. Which is why I'm very skeptical about all those isms. Because I really want to be careful 
if you are sitting there trying to think that you can design the future, you are doomed to fail. That much I can predict, because that's based on very strong historical experience. Finally, three, I will say one thing. One of the great poisons, the great poison, to my way of thinking, in um, societies all around the West right now is anger. Anger, social scientists tell us, close people's <coughs> minds. Anxiety, anxious voters, it opens their minds. Anger closes them. And it's a real problem. It's okay if in the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King is using anger to energize a small group so that he can have solidarity and they can get something done to push the establishment. That's one thing. But when everybody is anger, angry at everybody else, democracy collapses. Professor Miller, the last word is yours. <coughs> and one word will yeah, suffice. Yeah. <laughs> um, the question is interesting. And usually, the way we think about it is we think that, in some sense, economics drives the political domain. So part of the reason that liberal democracy, liberal democracy thrived and spread was because capitalism thrived and spread. And so we have a international kind of capitalist universe that we live in. Um, but we have to be careful going down that road because politics can, in very powerful ways, impact economic activity, and it's doing so now. So what we see is this rise of nationalisms, um, and essentially you see it partly in the battle between China and the United States. And the rest of us, I come from a relatively small country as well, Canada, and when these players start playing, I get very scared. Um, because if they start operating in baldly their own interest, it's small nations that are going to suffer. And, um, but basically, as a function of that fight, international capitalism and production is changing. It used to be, five years ago, you produced a product, it was created across a dozen or 20 countries, ultimately. But China and the U.S. are reconstructing their supply chains. Businesses are. They're nationalizing them. They're coming back to the U.S. And China is trying to do it on its own as well. So as we think about it, the politics of populism and some of its consequences, which is a more assertive form of nationalism, may undermine in its own way and change the very nature of the larger economic world. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all the speakers. I'm sorry we are out of time. Uh, a tiny comment? No, not even a tiny comment. Sorry. Uh, I think the only thing that's clear is that there is, yes, exactly, my prerogative, that the only thing that's clear is that the future of democracy is, is completely clear. Thank you for the wide range of discussion. Uh, I can't even wrap it up. There is no time. Uh, I need to turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies now. Thank you. I think we received much good for food. And our next event will be on the 30th of October, so stay tuned. Please subscribe to our mailing list and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Visit our website.